Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for coming. And we're going to read from a passage of Scripture which is well known, and it's in Acts chapter 9. Book of Acts and chapter 9, and we're going to read from verse 1. This is perhaps the account of the most famous conversion story in all of the New Testament, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, that is, the Christian way, followers of Jesus, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. And we trust that God will bless this short reading from his word. I want to speak to you about the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And also to speak to you about the process or the business of being converted. First of all, Saul of Tarsus was an outstanding person. He was a man of great intellect. He was a man of great zeal. He was a man of great religious fervor. He was a man who, in the tradition of Judaism, kept the law. And indeed could boast about the fact that he kept the law. And above his peers and equals, he stood head and shoulders. He was an outstanding scholar. He went to the best university of the day under the feet of Professor Gamaliel. He was his star pupil, if you like. If there had been awards and prizes, then Saul would have won them. He was a high flyer, we might say. And yet... Despite his success, despite the fact that he was the one who was selected to um, oversee the execution of a heretic in the Jewish religion, Stephen, we'll make reference to that in a few moments, despite the fact that he, as we've read, had these letters of authority from the chief priest, he was the highest religious figure in the day, the highest political figure in Judaism, Despite all of these things, he was not at peace. Why do I say that? Because he was a fanatic. We've just read. He's breathing out threatening and slaughter. We can read these words. And the impact of them sometimes is lost upon us. Breathing out threatening and slaughter against people. Why? Because they were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he sought the permission and the authority to pursue them as far as Damascus, about 120 miles away. This was in the days before EasyJet and before you could fly or move uh, long distances in a short time. But that was no distance, was no object. He was prepared to go to any lengths to uh, stamp out the name of Jesus, to stamp out the followers of Jesus. He was not at peace. Famous psychologist has said fanaticism is only found in those who have secret doubts. Think about it. He was absolutely ferocious. He's like a wild animal, really, the way in which his, his uh, uh, actions and his 
Behaviour is described for us, made havoc of the church of God. You look at the beginning of uh, chapter 8. Now Saul was consenting to his death, and at that time a great persecution against the church arose at Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout the regions of Samaria and Judea. And then it says this. Saul made havoc of the church, entering into every house, get the energy behind this, and dragging off men and women, committed them to prison. He would stop at nothing. And yet he was a very religious man. He tried to keep the law of God. That's what Jews did. They were given the law by God. They were given the law of Moses and they tried to keep it. And they knew that to break the law was a serious thing. And it was a sin against God. And so Saul from his youth had been taught you keep the law. You must keep the commandments. You must observe all the commandments and go even further. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Touching the law, he says of himself, blameless. Nobody could point a finger at this man in terms of his religious zeal. And yet in all the keeping of the law and in the trying to keep the law, he recognized that he could not keep it. His conscience troubled him. How do we know that? Because he wrote later on, he said, when I would do good, evil was present with me. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And he's speaking about the corruption that he finds within himself. Yes, externally. He had a perfect record. Nobody could point the finger externally, but inside. He knew that there was a difference. You know, that's true of all of us whether we are religious people or not, whether we aspire to high standards or not. Because God doesn't look in the outward appearance. He doesn't judge us by how others judge us. He judges us by the motivation of our hearts and what was on inside. And Saul's conscience was troubling him. He knew that he wasn't righteous Although he kept the law in every particular that he could, he knew that there was within him a sinful heart and a deceptive heart. He knew that sin lurked within. Well, of course, I know that you come regularly to this gospel meeting, which is great. And I know that you know the Bible, and I know that you know the story of Stephen. And how Stephen witnessed to these chief priests and Saul was there and he heard Stephen's defense. He heard Stephen's history of God's people. He heard about the claims of Christ. He heard about the fact that they had betrayed and murdered God's Christ, God's son. And he witnessed, in chapter 7, he witnessed the death of Stephen. He witnessed how he kneeled down and he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And he witnessed how Stephen died peacefully, calling upon God. And saying, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man, Jesus, standing on the right hand of the majesty on high. And it troubled him. He was the one that they came and threw down their cloaks as they cast and hurled the stones as they stoned Stephen to death, calling upon God and having, as it were, the face of an angel as he spoke to them prior to his martyrdom. They couldn't resist the spirit with which he spake. Why? Because it was the spirit of God that was speaking through Stephen. It was the power of God that was speaking through Stephen. As I read it, I can never uh, get away from the fact that he seemed to know that he was going to die. He seemed to know that this was going to be his final sermon. He seemed to know that these people were going to put him to death just as they had put the Lord Jesus to death. A short time before. But he was full of peace. And he was full of the Holy Spirit and power. And it troubled Saul. He had heard his assured handling of the scriptures. He had heard him speak about the prophecies concerning Christ. And the promise of Messiah. He saw his confidence in the face of vile and aggressive opposition. He saw that face, the face as of an angel, and he couldn't resist, they couldn't, like the rest, he couldn't resist the power with which he spake. There was something about him that troubled him deeply, 
There was something about these Christians that he took and cast into prison that troubled him. They seemed to have a peace and an assurance that he lacked. And then finally, I think, he had another problem, and he had doubts. He had doubts. Some of the scholars and the commentators uh, raise this question, and I just raise it now for your interest. Did Paul ever meet the Lord Jesus? Did he ever hear him? We can't be sure, but it's possible. But he certainly saw in Stephen and in the Christians a reflection And he heard of Christ, and he heard of the claims of Christ. He must have known about the claims of Christ and the miracles that he performed, of the teachings that he gave. Love your enemies. Do good to them who despitefully use you. He must have heard about the empty tomb. He must have heard about the claims of resurrection because Stephen had laid that clearly before them. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Those are the words of Peter, but that was the thrust of what Stephen was saying. And he must have heard about the empty tomb. I wonder what he was thinking as he made his way to Damascus that day. You know, his conversion was sudden. It was dramatic. You say, well, yeah, I've never seen a light. I've never heard a voice. No, that's right. It was a dramatic conversion. It was a, not an, an atypical conversion, if you like. The most famous conversion on all of the New Testament. But God had been working with him for a long period of time. That's what I'm trying to say. God, the Holy Spirit, had been pricking his conscience. It is hard, Jesus said to him, the Lord from heaven said to him, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. That prod that the cow herd used to make the reluctant animal move forward against its will. He was kicking against God. He was resisting God's overtures. One of the things about conversion is this, and it's obvious from this story is, Saul wasn't seeking God. Saul wasn't seeking Christ. But God was seeking him. You know, that's the whole point of conversion. It's a work of God. It's not a psychological thing. It's not something that just happens in a person's mind. It's a work of God in a person's life. No, you won't have a Damascus Road experience with sudden dramatic lights and voices but perhaps you're resisting God's appeals to you. Perhaps you're kicking against what God has been trying to say to you in the circumstances of your life, in the quiet moments of your life, in your conscience where no one else can see. Yes, it was dramatic. Yes, it was climactic. But it was a process by which God had been speaking to this man for a long period of time. I wonder, what about you? Are you... Aware of God's speaking to you? Are you aware of the Holy Spirit troubling your conscience? Are you aware of inward sin? Are you aware that no matter how much good you try to do, no matter how many good deeds or charitable work or whatever, no matter how good you are, you're still a sinner in God's sight because that's the way we all are. And so the next thing is, it's God's grace. Why should God pursue to forgive and justify a person like this? A murderous person, a violent person, a fanatical person, a person who could drag men and women off to prison for no other reason that they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour. As he says himself, I was an injurious person. He says... I received mercy. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, he says, of whom I am the chief. He didn't say that uh, blithely or not meaning it. He knew that he was rotten in sight. He was a sinner in God's sight. And so are you. And 
but so am I. It was God's grace that was pursuing him. He was acting like a wild animal out of control, wrecking the church, wrecking men and women's lives. Murderous, ferocious, animal-like, and yet God is calling him, and God is pursuing him, and Christ is speaking to him in grace and in mercy and calling him to repentance. And all the time he's opposing God and he's kicking back. He's resisting God's voice. He didn't deserve to be forgiven. None of us do. You don't deserve the grace of God. None of us do. But God showed him mercy. And God is prepared to show you mercy today. You too can be forgiven. You too can know with the Apostle Paul. Yes, he was righteous as far as the external keeping of the law was concerned. But inside there was a corrupt and sinful heart. So what about you? Is God calling you? Is your conscience trouble you? Are you resisting God's call? Are you willfully rejecting him and going on your own path? I repeat, conversion is a work of God. It's not a work of man. It's not a human thing. It's a, it's a, a divine thing. And of course, the whole point about conversion is it's an encounter with the risen Christ. You see, that's what Stephen had been saying. That was what the witness of the Christians was. This Jesus has been raised from the dead and he is exalted in heaven. The resurrection of Christ is the pivotal point of the Christian faith. Oh yes, men scoff at the resurrection. Men jeer at the resurrection. Men, like Paul, believe that Christ was an imposter. That he was just a figure of history like any other man. That Christ is dead and buried. But the fact is that Christ appeared to him. Christ spoke to him. Verse 3. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Can you imagine this proud Pharisee? This fanatic. This guy who was so convinced of the rightness of his own course. So apparently so determined and single-minded to stamp out the name of Christ. Suddenly, the very person that he had been so opposed to appears to him in that blinding light and speaks to him. God can arrest you on your downward track. Just let me think for a moment with you about the resurrection. As I say, the pivotal part the pivotal point of the Christian faith is the fact that Christ is risen. Yes, he died. Yes, he was buried. But he was raised on the third day. You've heard the arguments for the resurrection, I'm sure, many times. The empty tomb. Paul had heard that. The transformation of the 12 disciples and all of those who followed Christ from fearful, dispirited, timorous people to bold witnesses of the resurrection. The resurrection appearances of Christ 500 at one time, seven on the lake of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, twelve more than 12 of them on a mountaintop, another group on another mountaintop, more than 12 of them in an upper room. There are many, many resurrection appearances of Christ, two on the road to Emmaus. The growth of the church within just a few months of the resurrection, there were 5,000 in Jerusalem who were followers of Jesus Christ. And the history of the church from then till now. The gospel message having gone all around the world. All of these are evidences of the resurrection of Christ. But that means nothing to you if you're not prepared to face up to the fact that he is alive. That he is real. And that he wants you to be saved. He wants you to be converted. Yesterday I had the privilege, along with Linda, of listening to a man who was born in Pakistan. He was born a Muslim. His name is Riaz Mohammed. The clue is in the name. He said once he was in court, he, was a, he became a, a top surgeon and he was there as a, a witness in court. And the judge said to him, do you want to swear on the Quran? 
So, you know, I, I, I want to swear in the Bible, actually, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody in the court was going, oh, gassed. Anyway, the story is, growing up in Glasgow, his family moved to Glasgow when he was just a boy. Growing up in Bridgeton, in the south of Glasgow, as a poor family. He suffered a lot of racism, a lot of taunting, a lot of discrimination. He felt very isolated. He felt very alone growing up in an alien culture, not being accepted. Cut it short, he went to a youth camp. It wasn't a Christian camp, it was a holiday. He didn't ever have, ever have a holiday. He went with the school to a youth camp, but a young man who was a Christian befriended him there and showed him a lot of kindness and explained to him that he was a follower of Jesus. He was, an, he was a, a Christian, and that's why he liked to befriend people and do them good if he could. He, as a young man of 16, had an experience of meeting Jesus Christ and coming to a real faith in him. It cost him a great deal. His family disowned him. He was never included in any of the family activities. He, he never attended any of his, family, his brother's weddings or anything like that. They ostracized him. But he came into a living faith with Jesus Christ, an encounter with Christ, that's at the heart of conversion. And that's what you need. Saul said, who are you, Lord? In that moment, his whole world of opposition to Christ, his whole rebellion against God crumbled because in that moment, he realized he was on the wrong track. He realized that he was in opposition to God. He realized that Christ was risen. He was speaking to him from heaven. He realized that Christ was Lord. What will you have me to do? I think this story, this account of a man's conversion teaches us at least three things about God. God is sovereign. He controls everything in the world. He controlled, he allowed the death of Stephen. He allowed the persecution of the Christians. Sometimes things happen in our world. We think about the war in Ukraine and we don't understand and we think, why is that happening? God is sovereign, but he's in control and he will bring about his purposes. God is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy and a God of forgiveness. He wants to forgive you. He wants to justify you. He wants to bring you into his family and into the good of salvation. God is a God of power. Think of the transformation in Paul's life. If Paul had continued as Saul of Tarsus, as the arch persecutor of the church, we would probably never have known about him. We'd probably never have heard of him. A footnote in history. But he became the apostle Paul. He wrote most of the New Testament. You think of the number of churches. You think of the number of people who are called Paul that you know. That's because... He is perhaps the best known Christian in all of history because he came to know Jesus Christ as his own saviour and he became convinced of the fact that he was alive and exalted in heaven. May you trust this Jesus as your saviour. Thank you.